Are you fascinated by fungi? So out here on the Mendocino Coast, I'm with world famous mycologist Alan Rockefeller. What are we out here to do today? Today we're taking really good photographs and collecting specimens for scientific study. Cool. So we're going to look for some stuff that hopefully Alan can voucher and sequence and do microscopy. And we can use all the tools of a mycologist to delve deep into what's down in the ground. Alan, I'm curious, when did you get into sequencing and what kind of drove like the fascination of sequencing and where in your like mycology journey did you realize that that was something that was like going to be really important to you and what you were doing? Well, I started off with a microscope because mm -hmm. I wanted to see if I could discover new species with a microscope. Mm -hmm. And every time I scoped anything, it always ended up being what I thought it was. Mm. And I was like, oh man, this can't be right. Oh, because you're not just, you're not breaking new ground. You're just like, oh, it is, it is what I thought it was. And it's every not something time. different. Okay. Yeah. And that's because microscopes are not very good for closely related species. They're mm -hmm. kind of like... To, to differentiate similar. them because they look too close from the spores kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then I noticed that there was sequence stuff in all the new papers. Mm. And I asked a biohacker friend if that's something I could do at home. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh yeah, that's super easy. <laughs> so I started to accumulate the equipment. Cool. So this is a good, it's a good entry point for habitat. Nice and wet here. Yes. I'm very fond of this little drop-in point. Even though it's, you know, clearly other people come here. Ah! Oh my goodness! There's so much calicera on this log, it looks hairy. Oh yeah. Do you think that could be a new species? <laughs> Maybe. Is that your first thought when you think of a mushroom? Is like, is this a new species? No. I just wonder though. That this one... That one looks kind of cool, right? That, yeah, they all look really cool. It looks almost like a star or something. This looks like one of those lactarius where the milk stains oh, yeah. the gills purple. Yeah. Oh, it could be Californiensis. Yeah. Okay. And that's a big thing with lactarius and how to differentiate the species is you look not just at the color of the initial latex, but when it stains, if it turns brown or yellow or purple or, you know, whatever kind of staining color you'll see on a lactarius like this. What is one of the main things that you get out of sequencing mushrooms and being able to look at them in that really high resolution that you would never see from just looking at the morphology or looking at the spores or just, you know, looking at the habitat that they grow in? Well, the main thing I get out of sequencing is to tie collections together so I know which ones are the same and which ones are different. Mm. And from that, you can figure out what characteristics matter when you're trying to identify it and which things are just kind of variable. Okay. See so the kind of the core defining characteristics of a species from the DNA, the morphology, the microscopy, and like what commonalities are important or not as you define a particular yeah, species. Yeah, you know, like every time you find a mushroom, you can find something different about it. You'd be like, oh, maybe this is different because it's a little different color or it smells funny mm -hmm. or there's always something. Hmm. So being able to have a sequence of everything can tell you if that's something you noticed actually matters mm -hmm. or no, if it's just... Cool. It does that. I like your little camera set up there with the, uh, is it a sock full of rice or something like that? Or sand? Uh, I actually don't know what's inside it. Um, I found it in the basement of Counterculture Labs. And um, it was like this old yucky sock. So I cut it open and put it in one of my nice socks. <laughs> uh, but I still don't know what it is. Okay. I think it might be silica gel. It's like okay. these kind of shards of stuff. Could but something nice provides thing. a nice soft base for your camera to kind of sit on. Yeah. Keep it nice and stable as you take a macro shot. Yeah, like a bag of beans is nice, but mm -hmm. it's kind of slippery, mm -hmm. you know, so it could easily slide. So I think this is kind of nice because it doesn't really slide around. I know that you've changed the way that people look at a lot of different species in California because you've gone and done the sequencing and done the work to say, okay, this is, this is genetically distinct from the European version. What's the best way to access and understand a lot of the sequences that you're putting online? Because you're doing it in a way that allows other people to go out and learn from what you're doing, right? Yeah, you could search Mushroom Observer or Mycomap or GenBank. Mm -hmm. I and mean, there's two main ways to search for sequences. The first is a blast search. Mm -hmm. And that, that way you're just searching for similarity, similar sequences, or you can look it up by name. 
and they're both kind of valuable because when you look it up by name, you know, you're not necessarily finding stuff that is actually mm -hmm. the same, but you'll find stuff that people call the same. Mm -hmm. So that if there's like two different things that are pretty distantly related, mm -hmm. where people call them the same thing, that wouldn't come up in a black search. I see. So you're sort of biasing either by sequence homology or biasing by like people's perceptions of stuff yeah. and how they're similar. Yeah. And there's that kind of constant push and pull in modern mycology between like what's the history of the way that people have documented stuff versus what's the reality of what we're sequencing now and actually seeing the relationships. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. There's that duality between like the history of science and like the current aspect of where we're at now because of technology. Yeah, they're your yellow feet. They're out. But there's also, oh are these dusky boletes? Are they Malayaluka? Mm, I think they're boletes, not. Hmm? Xerocomus yeah. subtomentosus. How do you tell the difference between Xerocomus versus Xerocomelus? Xerocomelus will have red on the stem, mm -hmm. and these don't have red on the stem. Okay. But do they also have the yellow kind of mycelium on the base sometimes? I'm not sure. Because that's what I've heard that Xerocomelus often has like yellow. Yeah, Xerocomus always does. Oh, Xerocomus does, okay. I don't know if Xerocomelus does, yeah. yeah. Beautiful little like fuzzy bully top, yellow angled pores. Right now they're like growing out of duff and dead wood. It is a hedgehog, yeah. That's a nice looking one. Okay, so this is a hedgehog hydnum, and you can always tell it's a hedgehog because you have these beautiful little teeth underneath. And that's one thing you can always do with a mushroom is pick it turn it over and you look to see if there's gills or there's pores or there's teeth. There's these sort of basic morphological blueprints you can look at that'll help you identify a mushroom. So hedgehogs are great for beginners because they're pinky and they have these nice little teeth spines under the cap. So the first thing I'll do is get rid of the garbage because your eye is good at, at ignoring the debris but you know the cameras are just two-dimensional so shouldn't have it in there. And these redwood needles look kind of nice right there. Yeah. So this light I have on 1% brightness, so I'll also put it kind of far back because too much light will make it look ridiculous, but just yeah. tiny extra light is nice. It's taking 85 pictures at a quarter second each. So the aperture is all the way open, ISO 31. I have about 90% natural light and about 10% light from these LED lights. So I think it'll turn out good. So we just found this huge liver looking thing at the base of this chinkapin oak. This is a beefsteak fungus or fistulina hepatica. So it's a polypore mushroom that has been growing out for probably a couple months now because it's so big. And it's crazy because it's all kind of jelly-y and, and weirdly goopy on top. Uh, you can see the parts really close to the tree are, are much older and very, very soggy. And the parts out here are still actively growing. And it's kind of like coming down as a big polypore shelf. But this is called a beefsteak fungus because when you open it up, when you see the, the texture of it, it's super meaty looking. So this is incredible meat-like color and texture. See all those fibers in there? Underneath are little pores. And this is where the spores come out. But this is an absolutely insane looking specimen. This big, wet, goopy beefsteak. You see all these cool fibers. You can peel them, show off just how incredible this polypore mushroom is. So this is an edible mushroom. Uh, it has kind of like a light lemony flavor despite its very beefy appearance. You can eat it raw, uh, but you, I do suggest sort of cooking it if you want to eat a lot of it. Um, this one is so old and soggy that I don't think I'm gonna bother eating it but it is pretty cool looking. And let me show you something that happens when I squeeze it. It's gonna put all this bloody juice. Ugh. Wow, that is disgusting. <laughs> but what a cool thing to find, this big, awesome beefsteak. So I'll leave the rest of this to continue dispersing its spores, but I just wanna show you guys how crazy, awesome, meaty, and juicy this, uh, this mushroom is. <laughs> Oh my god. Ew. <laughs>